Good morning. Would you please stand with me and let us go to the Lord in prayer? Ask for his blessing to be with us as we open his word together. Father, we're grateful today because not only have you loved us with an unfailing and never-ending love, not only have you extended your mercy and your grace toward us, but Father, you have sent your word and you have given us your precious Holy Spirit that we might know your ways, that we might follow your paths, that we might pursue your heart. And Lord God, that we would do it with a clarity and an accuracy that not only reflects you, but gives honor and glory to you. So Father, here we are today to hear your voice, to learn more of your ways, to grow in your grace. Grant, please, Lord, that we would have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today. Grant, please, Lord, that we would have hearts that are open and vulnerable to the leading and the conviction of your Holy Spirit. Grant, Father, that we would not just listen to the Word, but, Lord, that we would do the Word and that we would participate in the endeavors that you have laid before us as your congregation and as your people. And for these things, we thank you in Jesus' precious name. And all the Lord's people who agreed said together, Amen. 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 You may be seated. And I want to invite you, please, to... Uh, we're going to get into the, the normal part of our sermon in a few moments in Philippians 1. But there's a couple of things I want to uh, talk about uh, this morning. So if you would look in Joshua chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible... Uh, if you didn't bring a Bible and you were dependent upon the notes, there should be a pew Bible near, nearby. Uh, and while you're looking for that, uh, I'd like to welcome all of you and thank you very much for being here. And if you're a guest with us, please fill out a card and give it to one of the ushers following the service. We would appreciate that. It's a busy week for us around here. Uh, every night there is a prayer meeting that goes on at 6.30 in the prayer chapel. Also, at 5 o'clock this afternoon, there's a Spanish language service in, uh, in, in uh, Wycliffe 105. SALT is tonight at 6.30, so all workers and leaders, you are required to be here. Uh, so don't make me come looking for you, all right? So you'll be here uh, at, at, at 6.30 tonight. Everyone is welcome, but leaders and workers, and we're going we're gonna to meet here in the cathedral tonight. We're going to pray. We're going to spend some time praying. And uh, after some of what I have to share today, you'll, you'll, you'll say, yeah, we really do need to pray. And, uh, and so that'll be going on. Friday night is a water baptism service right here in the, in the cathedral. So if you've not been baptized in water, you've not followed the Lord in water baptism, please see Reverend Fears. And, uh, and we would appreciate that. And, and uh, that'll be this Friday at 730. And then Saturday is the ladies ministry brunch. And that's going to be taking place at 10 a.m. And, uh, and we're excited for what the Lord is doing in the women's ministry. They have a Bible study goes on every Tuesday night. And, uh, and the Lord is blessing a great deal there. So if you uh, have any questions, sisters, and you don't need some more information, if you would please see Reverend Beebe. And uh, we would appreciate that. Next Sunday, and this, is, this doesn't bother my parents in Arizona, but this is a West Coast thing. Next Sunday is Daylight Savings Time. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't be late to church. <laughs> Turn to your other neighbor and say, don't be late to church. <laughs> okay. So we spring forward. All right. That's what it means. So next Sunday, you're going to be setting your clocks forward. My, my son and I, we, you know, Joshua pastors in Los Angeles, and, we, and we, we always talk about time change Sunday. Was this the good one or the bad one? You know, the good one's in the fall. That means everybody's in church early. Oh, that, you know, the bad one is this one, okay? So, uh, so remember to set your clocks forward, and, uh, and, and we're looking forward to, uh, to seeing you and to being with you. Uh, this has been uh, an eventful month in the body of Christ. And uh, the, there's the passing of, of Reverend Billy Graham has taken place. Uh, but also some other things that, that maybe you're, you're not quite as aware of. And in Joshua chapter 1, verse number 2, uh, the Lord is speaking to Joshua. And he says to him, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. Would you please read the first sentence and the first two words of the second sentence aloud together with me? 
Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then. Now then. Now then. We are seeing a, a transition in the body of Christ take place globally. As I mentioned, and as most of you are aware, Reverend Billy Graham, who was a, a, a great minister of the gospel, a great evangelist, uh, held uh, crusade revivals, uh, 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 ministered to presidents, Democrat and Republican alike, uh, for, for several decades of ministry, went home to be with the Lord. That's very well known in Europe and the United States, and, and his passing was celebrated even, even by, by, by politicians who probably needed to listen to him more than they talked about him. But, uh, but uh, nevertheless, that, 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 that took place. Uh, but in South Asia, another hero in the faith went home to be with the Lord as well. And many of you wouldn't know who he is, but I knew him personally, and that's Pastor Stephen Abraham, my friend Valson's dad. And uh, they passed away within days of each other. And the reason I bring this up is I find it very significant that men who had such profound influence on, on thousands and millions of people, uh, Reverend, Reverend Graham preached to multiplied millions of people around the world. Uh, Pastor Stephen Abraham was the head of a church of thousands of churches with millions of members around the world. It's just being in, in South Asia, we here don't hear about it as much. And so men who have this kind of stature in the kingdom, men who have this kind of reach in the kingdom, similar to when Dr. Patton passed and others who've passed, when they have this kind of stature and this kind of reach, this kind of influence in the kingdom of God, not only do we have to kind of pause and consider the, the life and the ministry of these individuals and thank the Lord for their life and thank the Lord that, that they have influenced and touched others, but we're, we're in that now then. You know, I've often heard it said, and I think I've even said it a few times, who's the next Billy Graham going to be? I don't, I don't know. And no one had heard of Billy Graham before Billy Graham became Billy Graham. And Pastor Stephen, none of you had ever heard of him. But in India, uh, at his service just um, uh, a couple weeks ago now, um, there was 41 people a minute that were passing by as he, uh, for the viewing of, of, of his remains. And that went for four and a half hours. Just the viewing, the sphere of influence, the level of influence, the depth of influence. I met Pastor Stephen. I think I've shared that with you before. It was one of the few people I ever went in my whole life and went, ah, this is probably what an apostle is. In a very real way, very anointed, very powerful, very small in stature, but powerful in the kingdom of God. And so the question is the now then. How deep are we going? How broad are our shoulders? How are we preparing for others to stand upon our shoulders? Wesley spoke of the fact that God calls his workers home, but his work continues. God calls his workers home, but his work continues. Moses my servant is dead, now then. Joshua, you were Moses' aide for 40 years. Moses is gone, but I'm not gone. Moses has passed, but I've not passed. Moses led the people to this moment and this time. Now you're going to lead them into the next moment and the next time. And so that is, is, is kind of the thought that struck me in, in, in considering what, what has taken place is we celebrate their life and we thank God that they have received their reward and glory, but we're in the now then moment. And the what is next moment. And so I want to speak to you this morning and what we've been talking about, but I want to I want to kind of drill down into it a little deeper today about what we will do today. And I want to speak with you about the now then, but I also want to speak to you about the next and I'm not talking about the next year. 
I want to speak to you about the next 50 years. Should the Lord tarry? Should the Lord tarry? What are we doing now? That plan right there, Moses, my servant is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. Was the goal of God the crossing of the Jordan? Was the goal of God the taking of Jericho? Was the goal of God the taking of Ai? Was the goal of God what, what Joshua could see? Or was the goal of God what Joshua couldn't see? But he had a part the crossing of the Jordan didn't take that long. The taking of Jericho didn't take that long. The subduing of the promised land took longer. And what didn't reach its full extent until King Solomon. But the fact of the matter is, you and I play a part in this march of God. And God has been marching and moving and touching and changing and challenging and redeeming and healing and delivering lives. And you and I get a small window of time to participate in his grand work. I shared with you once before, and I'll share it with you again. Pastor Stephen Abraham's son, Valson, was a mentor to me. In fact, I just spent the last few days uh, at the Indian Christian Assembly uh, speaking at their conference in Southern California. And, uh, and, and, and the Lord moved very mightily, and, and I'm very grateful for that. But when I was a much younger man, Valson is the one who looked at me and said, how is your 500-year plan? I'm only talking about 50 today. He said, how is your 500-year plan? I about choked on my coffee and my English muffin when he said it. I said, well, 500 years. You know, I think I was 25 at the time. I mean, five years was a long way, all right? 500 years is crazy. But he said, no, what are you doing today? Should the Lord tarry that will impact your children's, 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 children for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Amen. The Lord deals in long-term plans. The Lord sees beginning and end simultaneously, but he works in long-term plans. Even in the life of the patriarch Abraham, you had a 500-year plan from the time of Isaac until the children of Israel were delivered. God was working this out, making a promise based upon an outcome that the patriarch himself would never personally see. Then he talked to me, my, my friend Valson talked to me about his spiritual heritage. His dad, Stephen, his grandfather. His grandfather was the um, founding leader of the Pentecostal movement in the nation of India. Okay? Kicked out of the Syrian Orthodox Church because he had come into a, an, an, an experience of Pentecost. To come into an experience of, 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 of tongue-talking, faith-believing, walking person. And, and the Syrian Orthodox said, no, 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 no. <laughs> and, and so he didn't set about to start the Pentecostal movement. He just had no choice. There was no other place for him to go to church. Now that organization and that movement has multiplied thousands of churches around the world. But even before that, and he wasn't being, you know, uh, insulting toward the Syrian Orthodox legacy, because he said, our family can trace its spiritual roots to the Apostle Thomas preaching among, among Syrian and Jewish merchants in Kerala. 2,000 years. How's your 500-year plan? How's your 500-year plan? So when we think of 50 years, now I'm, I'm 55. I know I don't look a day over 75, but I'm 55. I can remember 50 years ago. I can remember it pretty well. I can remember being five years of age. I remember 1967. I remember it. I remember my dad being at war. So that's why that season of life is very real to me because my dad was, was fighting in Vietnam. And so I, 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 that's, that's there in my mind. But when I think back 50 years, I don't think back on what were you doing June 23rd, 1972. Have no idea. Have no idea. Maybe on my birthday, maybe on a, 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 a Christmas, maybe at a wedding or a death. You, those are highlights. Maybe when your family bought a house. 
Maybe when this event or that event happened. That's how you look back. That's how memory works. You remember these moments that are, that are significant and you think back and, you, and, you, and then, then attaches to other things. Well, that's sort of how long-term casting works too. I'm not going to tell you every little nuance and every little detail because I'm not smart enough for that, frankly. I'm certainly not spiritual enough for that. But I do want to share with you today some of the things I think the Lord wants us to do. Engaging ourselves in his work. Trusting that I'm going to lay out for you five broad categories of ministry and I think the Lord probably has 10 or 15 that our children and grandchildren are going to be doing. But I don't know exactly what they are. I believe that they're going to expand beyond anything I can imagine. Because I'll be honest with you, I've been here 12 years and stuff has gone different directions and things have come to pass that I never dreamt could come to pass. Both good and bad. Both challenging and glorious. And yet here we are. And my fear, and I use that word carefully... My fear is never what the devil's going to do. Don't get me wrong, I believe in spiritual warfare. I believe there are demons and devils, I, I, and I'm not a superstitious person, but I, I, I believe the Bible, and the Bible tells me this. Okay? I believe that. But I don't worry about him, because that same Bible tells me that greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. So I don't, I, don't, I don't even worry about him. And that same Bible shows me that demons like to do their work in darkness and in deception and hiding. So when they are exposed, they are very vulnerable. That's not my fear. My fear is not the devil. My fear are not the politicians. I make fun of them, but they're not my fear. My fear is not the court system. My fear is not the education system. My fear is not any of those things. Here is the fear that your pastor tries to wrestle to the ground every single day. Will I have courage sufficient to the task to obey the Lord? Will we have courage sufficient to the task to obey the Lord? Because all that matters, and frankly, all that stands between you and I doing what the Lord wants done is our obedience. Amen. There's no demon, there's no devil, there's nothing in heaven or hell that can stop the will of God from being accomplished. The only thing that he has in his sovereignty allowed is the will of humanity. You have a choice to obey. You have a choice to disobey. This same book, Joshua 24, 15, not on the screen because I didn't tell it we were going here. But Joshua says that when he's leaving the scene, begins with Moses, my servant is dead. It ends with Joshua leaving the scene. And what he says to the people of God is, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and mine, we're going to serve the Lord. Now, you cannot serve the Lord and be blatantly, openly, knowingly disobedient to the Lord. So I pray for clarity. And I pray for courage. Clarity of what the task is. And courage to obey the Lord in the task. That's all we got to worry about. We don't have to worry about money. Turn to your neighbor and say, you don't have to worry about money. <laughs> Pastor, did you just get crazy? No, I just, I've seen the Lord do too much now. <laughs> don't have to worry about money. It doesn't mean you be a poor steward. Because now you're in the area of obedience or disobedience again. You steward his resources, you'll always have enough resource to do his will. Okay, so that's not the issue. 
What if we, well, we have enough personnel, we have enough people? Well, that's why Jesus said, pray for the Lord of the harvest to send workers. We've got to ask him to help us with this. Because again, it's this partnership thing. It's now then. So as we dive into the unique portion of our mission today, I want you to kind of, I wanted you to kind of bear this in mind. The body of Christ globally is in a season of profound transition. And we haven't the luxury. Now, please don't take personal offense at this because I mean none. Okay? But you and I haven't the luxury to look back and long for yesterday. Billy Graham's not coming back. Pastor Abraham's not coming back. Dr. Patton's not coming back. And there'll come a day when I leave and, and I'm not coming back. I promise you, I'm not coming back. <laughs> okay, when I'm gone, I'm gone. Happily so. All right? So we don't have the luxury to stand in the moment, now then, looking back and saying, oh, I wish it were like that. Yesterday's pain can rob you of tomorrow's blessing, and yesterday's blessing can become tomorrow's idol. If you're not careful. So the issue again, go back to what does the pastor fear? Well, I have courage sufficient to the task to obey the Lord. Because he is a God who moves forward. Amen. He's going to do his work. So with that in mind, let's get back to our text and remind ourselves that we're in this together. And in Philippians chapter 1, and while you're turning there and while sister is, uh, is transitioning the PowerPoint for you, please be reminded that we live and serve in this place and at this time for the eternal purposes of God and by his sovereign design. You're here right now because the Lord chose you to be here right now and you obeyed him. It is a wonderful grace to be allowed to participate in the work of the Lord together. Church is not you coming and watching musicians play or singers sing or speakers speak. That's not what church is. Church is us engaging in the Holy Spirit of God, engaging in the work in the word of God, and therefore engaging in the work of God. As we are engaging the spirit and the word that compels us to do the work. And so that work is what we're is what we're talking about. So in Philippians 1, verse 3, he says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. And so the work is the work of the Lord. The ministry is the ministry of the Lord. He began it. He sustains it. He'll keep it. So you and I have not been called to do our own ministry. We've been called to engage in the ministry of Christ. We do it in his love. We do it by his power and for his glory. And so whatever the Lord lays in front of us, it's, for, it's, it's, it's not for us to do, to take any kind of ownership of. That's idolatry. It is for us to steward because he is the owner. He is the owner. We serve at his pleasure. And again, we must have courage sufficient to the task to obey his will. So, since this all belongs to him, we're grateful for his promise. This is in your notes. We've talked about it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. The promise of Jesus is that he would build his church. The vision of Christ, number one in your notes, was the great promise of Jesus. Number two was the great commandment and the great commission the Lord outlined for us, his vision for the church. 
the macro and the universal calling. And so we've talked about this. Again, I don't want to, I don't want to spend time because we, we, we're going to his table today and I want to, I want to lay some things in front of you. But the great commandment and the great commission of the Lord are simply this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the, great, the second one is love your neighbor as yourself. So this is worship and this is ministry. Then the great commission is go. Go. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost and teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. And most assuredly, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So these, number three in your notes, these, these things that we've, we've talked about uh, so far this year, this is the universal vision of Jesus for his church. This is if Tom and I were, were, were starting a church together, those, these are the five things we would do. If Pastor Valson's uh, uh, several thousand churches, these five things have to be done. Whether it's a liturgical church, an evangelical church, a Pentecostal church, any number of, if it is a true church of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will do these five things. Amen. Okay, and here's what they are. You will worship him. You will serve ministry. You will engage the lost in evangelism. You will incorporate the body into fellowship, the sense of family, the sense of friendship, the sense of unity, the sense of purpose. And you will train disciples. You will teach people to follow Jesus. Okay? So the vision is universal and it's macro. The mission, though, the mission is unique. And here's what I mean by that. Tom and I go to Star Church. Okay. Where's it going to be? Well, I don't know. Where's the Lord wanting it to be? Okay, and here's how the Lord does. He begins to put a burden on a person for, for an area of town or for a new city or for maybe a ministry across the sea somewhere. So, so that, that starts to form what it's going to look like in terms of its mission. The Lord's called us here. So our, our mission is unique in many ways. The Lord has placed us here, and, and you and I, now some of you were here from the beginning, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm the new kid on the block here. I've only, I've only been here a few years. But there's all those five elements that are going to have to go, but in, and they're going to have to be involved in every part of our mission. But the mission is the scope and the how of the vision. Let me give you an example. Got a house across the street, a house next to it, house over here, house over there. Houses all have kind of, in, at least in the United States, kind of the, the same basic uh, elements are in a house. You're going to have a living space, a cooking space, uh, a, a getting ready uh, space, and, and, you know, so you're going to have, you're gonna have and, and a sleeping space. So you're going to have bedrooms, living room, kitchen, bath, okay? Every, every house kind of has something along those lines. But then there are other houses that, that have those same things, but they're ginormous. And they have maybe more elegant things. And, 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 and you know, some of these houses, their door costs more than your house. But at the end of the day, it's still a house. But where it is and, and the location kind of determines its structure. If you get a house on the side of the hill, you got stilts and, and they're digging down and they're going deep and all that kind of stuff, you know? You get a house in a floodplain, then you shouldn't have bought it. But that's another story. Okay. <laughs> okay. But houses all have kind of the same element, but yet, isn't it true that even when you go in and you buy a home in a track, what's the one thing you want to do? Find something unique about it. You're the one guy that paints your house purple, you know, or you're the one guy that paints it bright orange or, or, or whatever. Because it just, it, you know, there's something unique about you and that's your house. Well, see, the church is, is this wonderful grace universally. Okay? You and I have brothers and sisters all around the world. And it's amazing because I've been in places where I couldn't speak the language, but I spoke the spirit. And I'm not talking about a, 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 a gift of tongues. I'm talking about I would meet somebody and our spirit would bind. It's like, oh, wow. 
I couldn't talk to them in English and they couldn't speak to me in English and, 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 and all of those kinds of things. But the spirit bore witness. And we have that universally. But yet the Lord is, is concerned about the unique mission of this place. And the unique mission of your life. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 12, it's not going to be on the screen, so you actually have to write this down. But t Paul uses the body metaphor. And he, and he talks about the body and, and he says, you know, not everybody's a hand and not everybody's a foot and not everybody is a, a, a mouth and not everybody is this, that or the other. We're all unique and we're all different. And so what the Lord will do is within a congregation, he will gift individuals with gifts and talents that help that congregation express the purposes of God for that particular ministry. Does that make sense? Okay. The Corinthian church was gifted in different ways than the Ephesian church. And the Ephesian church was gifted in different ways than some of the other New Testament churches. In fact, the Corinthian church was very gifted in the quote unquote sign gifts. They were, they were probably the Pentecostals of the crew. All right. They also were the ones that Paul had to correct the most. I'm not saying anything. I'm just, you know. I'm just, I'm just laying that out there. Okay. The Ephesians, they were diligent workers born in signs and wonders, diligent workers, doctrinally pure, all of that. But they got so regimented that Jesus had to correct them. In Revelation 2, about losing their first love. Okay. But the point is, in every one of the churches in the book of Revelation, the Lord commends them for certain things that is unique to their situation. And then he corrects them for certain things. And this is the way the Lord does his work. Everybody has, we all need to worship. We all need to evangelize. We all need to serve. We all need to fellowship. We all need to, we all need to, to, to learn to grow in the grace and knowledge of God. That's universal. But the scope of it is unique. So just like in this congregation, the Lord will bring and gift people to help us do his will Amen. for this corporate house. Amen. Now, listen to me. What he'll then do is this corporate house has something to offer the Oakland body of Christ and the East Bay body of Christ and maybe the Bay Area body of Christ, and maybe even larger than that, we have something unique to offer the rest of the body of Christ that can't be done without us. And this is how the body's supposed to work together. I'm not supposed to do what every other pastor does. I'm supposed to do what the Lord's told me to do. And the other pastors are supposed to do what they've told them to do. And then the churches are supposed to do what the Lord's shown us to do. And then collectively, we're fulfilling the mission of the Lord for this region, for this area. Let me give you a few examples of how this works. We do not do what the Salvation Army does. Turn to your neighbor and say that. We don't do what the Salvation Army does. We don't do what a, a mission in the tenderloin does. Okay? We don't do what, what some of the churches that are on television do. That's their mission. We help the Salvation Army do what they do. We help some of the missions do what they do. We don't do it. Why? The Lord didn't, didn't put that in our DNA here. Now, we still have to minister. We still have to serve. We still have to love the lost. We still have to take care of the poor and the broken. So why should we compete against the mission of the Salvation Army when we can bless the mission of the Salvation Army? Likewise, however, the Salvation Army doesn't have schools. We do. They don't raise up children from ch childhood through adulthood in an educational system. W we do. And we're almost one of the last Christian educational institutions, K through 12, even in the higher ed, right, Dr. Monster? We're one of the last Christian educational systems in the entire Bay Area. 
It's us. Why do we do that? Because the Lord told us to. Why does this church subsidize that mission so, so much? Because the Lord told us to. It's part of who we are. It's part of what we do. Not everyone has an orchestra. We do. It's part of who we are. It's part of what we do. Not everyone has strong pastoral care ministry. The Lord has blessed us with strong pastoral care ministry. We have, we have a pastoral care team. I, and I've told people at Salt, I, I, I'm not sure I should say this in public like this, but you know, uh, you know Reverend Fears, Reverend Beebe, Reverend Minerva, and other ministers, and, and other elders, and, and uh, pa Pastor Mata, you know, you're, you're sick, afflicted, a member of this church, we're going we're gonna to have somebody see you. Someone's going to pray for you. Someone's going to be there, anoint you with oil, take communion to you. Okay, that's, that's what we do. Now, now listen, if I'm there, you're really sick. <laughs> I just, I'm just letting you know. <laughs> okay. Oh, I said that at Salt one night, and then about a month later, one of our members was sick, and 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 um, and and it was, it, and I just thought, well, I'll go by and see him, just pray for him. I walked in the room, and their eyes got up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, pastor, it's you. <laughs> I, I must no, and I, I said, oh, no, 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 you're not that bad. You're <laughs> but it's part of who we are. The Lord's blessed us with this. Not everyone has an educational mission, but we do. Our evangelistic efforts, this is the Christian Evangelical Churches of America. That's our formal name. Our evangelistic efforts are going to be based upon church planting and church development. Doesn't mean we're not going to go win the lost individually, one on one, or those. Of course we are. I have a strong belief that the New Testament model for evangelism is church planting. You go put a church to be salt and light in an area and let them go win the lost in that area. So we're going to help that. We're going to foster that. We're going to facilitate that. Much of the body of Christ has a pulpit teaching ministry as their priority. Probably in, in, in Western culture, outside of maybe some places in the South, 90% of, of, of pastoral ministry from the pulpit is teaching ministry. And teaching is a wonderful gift, and teaching means to explain. You in this church, and Dr. Patton and then me, You've always had a preaching pulpit. The difference between teaching and preaching is not volume. The difference between teaching and preaching is teaching is to explain and preaching is to declare. And one of the things that the Lord calls me to do and one of the things the Lord calls us to do is to boldly declare the word of the Lord and what God is saying right now. Amen. In this moment. Now these are things that we do. So in addition to the universal vision of Jesus for his church, we, he has given us a unique mission. Thomas Rainer said, this is the most unchurched generation in America. So you and I must, like the Apostle Paul in Romans 1, have a great sense of obligation. We must have a great sense of obligation to people in our culture, as well as people in other cultures, to the educated and to the uneducated alike. Everyone in this room that I know, personally, I sense that most of you have a great sense of obligation to Jesus Christ. Amen. And I appreciate that deeply. Amen. Paul took it one more step. He said, not only is my, am I obligated to the Lord himself, I'm obligated to people around me. For the sake of the gospel. We've got to get to that frame of mind. Where that we see the lost and we see the broken and we see the hurting and we see the wounded through the lens of Jesus. Through the obligation to reach the lost. Paul told the Corinthian church, his love has the first and the last word in everything that we do. And so... 
in identifying the elements of our unique mission. Here's how the Lord directed me. So I'm going I'm to give you a three-year walkthrough in 45 seconds or so. Okay. Unlike the church in Corona, which the Lord led me to start. So that's a different thing. You start a church and you, you sit down and go, okay, Lord, what's this supposed to look like? Who are we and what are we about? And you write it out, you offer it before the Lord. The church that's planting you, you get their confirmation. Those that are going with you, you get their confirmation. And then you just start, you start running. You start doing that. I can remember... Uh, I, we'd been open maybe a year or so, and I, I received a call in the office. A sister called and said, and, and started asking me all sorts of questions about the church, because we were a new church, and we'd just gone public. You know, we'd started in houses, and we we're finally on Sunday morning, and we'd just gone public. And, and, and invariably, one of the questions came down to, well, what kind of worship do you have? Now, I'm, 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 I'm going to defend myself here for a minute, Okay. This is 1989, so I'm 26 years old, going to be 27, okay? And before, see, now, now there's a little guy with a visor that lives inside my head that says, don't say that. Do you guys have that guy? Yes. Okay. When I was 27, that guy didn't exist. So before I could get the words back into my mouth, they were gone. And so she said, what kind of worship do you have? I said, the kind I like. <laughs> that was my great spiritual theological premise on how we worshiped. The kind of worship I like. There was no great, oh, the kind that glorifies and blesses the name of Jesus with a contemporary flavor and a combination. No, it was the kind I like. I go to church where I go to church. I go to church there, you know. Well, that's, that's kind of silly, isn't it? But that's what happens when you start. You can kind of just adjust as you go. Well, I didn't start this work here. Dr. Patton did. I, 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 I was brought in. And this work was going and moving and, and everything else. And so I spent a, a good portion of time just trying to figure out how you guys did stuff. And I stepped on a few eggs couple landmines I didn't know about. <laughs> I mean, it's like, whoa, I didn't know that was a big deal. <laughs> Note to self. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't own a suit till I got here. <laughs> I had to buy four just so I could have clean clothes for a month. All right. <laughs> And so all of those things, you, you come in, then you, now you start observing. You start observing. I remember about six weeks into this, because I, I, uh, I was commuting at the time, back and forth from L.A. to here, because Christopher was in his senior year. And so I, I was talking to Rhonda on the phone one day. And I said, I still haven't been able to figure out how they get anything done. I can't figure the policy out. I think if doctors said, this is what we're doing, that became the policy. Which was, I could relate to, because that's how it was for us in Corona. Yeah, whatever I said is kind of what we did, you know. And, uh, but when you're coming into that, it's different. It's different. You can't take this hand. You have to take this hand. You're not allowed to do this. Oh, you're allowed. You just won't stay long. You have to do this. And I said, but, but here's what I, I have observed so far. One, they're very smart. And two, they love each other a great deal. And that makes it work. Because they're really trying to do the will of God as they understand his will to be. That was my observation. I could work with that. Because that's all I, that's, except for the very smart part, that's all I'm trying to do. Is do the will of God as I observe it to be. So, so then you begin to observe, who is this ministry and what's it supposed to be doing, Lord, for the next 50 years? 
after I'm dead and gone or raptured, and if it's raptured, it's irrelevant, but after I'm dead and gone, what systems need to be in place? What policies need to be in place? What makes the transition maybe easier for the next man or woman who follows? And they can take it to another place. The rebuilding of the walls is different than the foundations. I didn't lay the foundations here, but I have some, some gaps in the walls like Nehemiah that my God called me to. And so you begin to make these observations. And so about three years ago, I came to the, to the board and began to share with them my thoughts of, as I understood what the Lord was saying after all those years. And then, and then you'll remember that we had seasons of crisis. We had a crisis with the university. And then I had a personal crisis, which wasn't just personal. It was ours. You know, you, you lose half the pastoral couple, you, you've lost a pastor. And that, that's a, that was a reality. And we all, we all had to kind of step back and figure out who we were and what we were about individually before the Lord. It's a hard thing when your prayers don't get answered the way you want them to get answered. Amen. And it's a challenge when you open that book and you have to share it with authenticity and integrity. When you personally are struggling at, at the deepest levels of your, of your emotion and of your psyche. So we had those crises. So, so we began then, and Dr. Moncher was so gracious to me during that season. And I'd like to publicly acknowledge that because there were things he, he, he wouldn't let me know about. He protected because I, I, I had a very limited capacity at that time to deal with problems. And so we were managing a crisis. We had spent a season of dealing with financial crisis almost from the day I got here, and then the university crisis, and then the personal crisis. That was a corporate crisis. And it was difficult, it was transitional, and yet the Lord would always provide. He would provide financially, miraculously. He would provide emotionally, surprisingly. I never, ever in my wildest dream could imagine the healing balm that a grandchild is. I could have never imagined the healing balm that a good friend is. And I could have never imagined the good balm to the soul that a word of the Lord fitly spoken into one's life is. And so we still manage problems and we still have big problems. Our, our issues are, you know, we don't do anything small. They're big problems, okay? But they're not existential crises now. That's a huge difference. We're not sitting here going, how can we survive in Oakland? That's, that, that issue's dealt with. God has miraculously dealt with that. So in your notes, we're entering Genesis years now. We're entering a season and time in which we have five years or so of new beginnings. A season of creation. A season of setting pathways in place. A season of setting the framework for growth. Remember, I told you I want to talk about the next 50. So we have the tithe years now on those 50. And what you do in the first five years of a season will determine a whole lot about that season. Psychologists tell us that a child's personality is fully developed by the age of six. That's a terrifying thought. <laughs> Explains a lot, but terrifying thought. Okay, so are we going to do in the next five years all the things that will allow us to accomplish in 50? Of course not. Of course not. But what we want to do is put the pathways together. Create the templates. Do the lab work. Some of it we're going to go like, you know, do you remember lab, what you did at the end of lab? You just kind of did this and threw it away. I have no problem saying that didn't work. I thought I heard the Lord direct something and I was wrong. I have no problem with that. My fear is that I don't try what he's telling me to do. 
So we have this season of Genesis to lay out what the Lord will do for our children and our grandchildren should he tarry. So given that I'm from Los Angeles, not originally, I was born in Moses Lake, Washington, but no one outside of Moses Lake, Washington knows where Moses Lake, Washington is. I was born on an Air Force base. But I was raised in Los Angeles, in the Los Angeles area. So I could relate to the idea of a freeway or an avenue with several lanes. Every time I go down, every time I go home, I think, I can't believe how wide this freeway is. I was, I was outside of Joshua's house and, and both, both directions of traffic in that particular section of the Inland Empire, I counted uh, 13 lanes all the way across. It's crazy. And I love the speed at which they drive, though. <laughs> Glory to God, if it's open, we're going fast. Okay. <laughs> and you'd better move. How <laughs> I many you know what I'm talking about? All right. Is there anybody else that with a guy that's going the speed limit in the fast lane just gets under your skin a little bit? You know who you are. I'm going to pray for you. And, and you pray for me when I'm flashing the headlights that you get out of my way. All right, now. Freeways are constructed of the same material in each lane. Okay? In this case, the highway, the concrete, is the vision of the Lord. So each lane has to have elements of worship, serving, evangelism, fellowship, and training in them. But different parts of the ministry may be traveling at different rates of speed, like a slow lane or a fast lane. But the important thing is that they're all moving forward. So, sister, if you go to the next slide. So what I'm going to lay out for you is, is the lanes on the highway. The material in the highway is worship evangelism, ministry, training, fellowship. Every lane has to have that. Okay? That's the vision. But the mission is the things that God has told us to do specifically. And those are five different lanes. Go to the, the, the next one. So strategic pathways, lanes. Yeah, that's not showing up as clearly as I was hoping. I'm sorry. You, you can go back to that. But this, the, here's the idea. That if you could imagine again those lanes, we have a lane of education. Okay? We have a lane of pastoral care, nurture, and fellowship. We have a lane of worship arts Amen. and music. Not just, not just music, but arts. Okay? The Lord's blessed us with artists. I mean, uh, what, 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 what uh, John and Dr. Rebecca did for that family room stained glass is amazing to me. And I thank the Lord for it. Arts are very important. I'm going to talk more specifically about these things next week. But I want, I want to lay them out in front of you. We have a unique missional idea or component of the pulpit. It's different than some places. Not better. I'm not even suggesting that. Just different. And something that we're committed to. And we have a, a, a commitment to church planting and church development. These are the five things that over the next 50 years we want to be known as before the Lord. Now, how did we come to that? Your pastor, again, I, I observed. What do you guys do? Your pastoral care ministry was excellent. You have orchestra, choir, arts. The pulpit was always a preaching pulpit. Education has been part of your founding since before the church actually was founded. Am I correct? After a long revival in the 40s, Dr. Patton gave an altar invitation for those that wanted to be trained and equipped for Christian ministry. And as Dr. Moncher has related the story, 300 or so people came forward. Maybe so. Yeah, 300 or so people came forward. And out of that came the Oakland Bible Institute. The Oakland Bible Institute became the Patton Colleges and Seminary. Patton Colleges and Seminary became the Patton Bible College, and then Patton College, and then Patton University, and now it's a Patton Educational Foundation. The Patton Academy of Christian Education, PACE, began to help those, those uh, soldiers who were returning from the war to go to Bible college. They didn't have high school diplomas, many of them. And so what did she do? She started a high school to get them a high school diploma so they could go to college. 
And out of that endeavor came a K through 12 school. That is, and since I'm, I'm not the educator, I can say this, I can brag a little bit, it is excellent. Amen. And I thank the Lord for it. It is excellent. Has the highest rating WASC gives. The highest rating that the Western Association of Schools and Colleges gives. A secular entity that, that came and, 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 and gave accreditation to institutions. That, that secular agency recognized, and I've read their report, they recognize the Christian ethos that is within the school and the academics that the school produces. I thank God for that. The higher ed component is taking on a whole nother dimension and hopefully we'll be able to talk even more about that within the month and if we get there then I'm going to have Dr. Moncher talk to you about that. But what God is doing on that side what we can train and release men and women for ministry and Christian leadership who are thoroughly equipped to go, now listen to me, I'm going to use a term you may not like, but we want to raise up Christian leaders who go and disrupt the world system. Because the gospel is profoundly disruptive. But they need to be thoroughly equipped, not just in theology, not just in, in hermeneutics, not just in homiletics, not just in Greek and Hebrew. They need to be thoroughly equipped in business. And in law. So we're committed to these things. Now, you say, well, why, why are you saying all this, Pastor? Because not only is it important that the board gets it and that the leadership gets it but this is we're in this together this is a partnership so when I asked the board two years ago to commit to this the board of trustees what you're asking is commitment of priority making these the priorities now what's a priority a priority is not what you say is important a priority is what you give time to energy to and resource to so when we say we're committed to pace the Patent Academy of Christian Education we have to do this to WASC and other entities. Yes, we stand behind it financially. It isn't supplied simply by tuition. We stand behind it. Because it's part of our mission. So when we go to start other churches, or when other churches merge with us, which I'll talk about next week, which has already taken place, and the Lord has given us property in San Francisco Amen. that we would have and could not have bought. But it's been given. It's been given to us. Well, that goes into church planting and development. That's the one component that I observed that we weren't doing. We did it by osmosis. You had people that leave, left the university and started works, obviously. Ben Robinson and others right around here who did, who did great things and they're part of, our, part of our tree of fruit or fruit of our tree. But we're going to do it intentionally. And we're going to do it with great intentionality over the next 20 years as the Lord lets me live that long and serve you that long. Because it's part of who we are. So I share all these things with you because next Sunday I want to talk to you about how. This is the what. I want to talk to you next Sunday about how we do this. How we generate the revenue necessary. Don't worry, I'm not taking an extra offering. That's not even, you know. But if the Lord, no. I, I, love, it when, I love it when preachers do that. Oh, we're not taking an offering. But if the Lord lays it upon you. I trust you enough to obey the Lord when it comes to giving. This is a, this is a giving church. We don't, the Lord, the Lord, you've always been a giving church. And so... I thank the Lord for you. But all due respect, unless, unless there's a couple billionaires in here that I don't know about, <laughs> the tithe off of our congregation will not fund what the Lord has told us to do. See, that's why we have to think about these things in different ways. And the Lord's helping us. Now, all of this is important. Because you and I have to know and commit ourselves to who we are 
and what we're about so that when times of crises come, we don't bail out. When times of difficulty arise, we don't snipe at each other. And when times of celebration come, none of us take the credit. All the glory goes to the Lord Jesus Christ. And all the honor goes to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, that little thing about the church planting and development, I presented this to the board. The board approved it as a priority stream and said, yeah, we'll commit to these things. Time, energy, resource. And I gave them much more detail than I've given you. It was within a month that those other opportunities came to us. And it was the Holy Spirit, in my opinion, saying, yes, that's my direction for you. And I'm giving it to you. So here we are today. And I'm talking to you about things that you may not live to see and I may not live to see. But my friends, not only is Moses dead, the Moseses of our life always die. Now then. Now then. The Dr. Pattons go home. The Billy Grahams go home. The Stephen Abrahams go home. The Toby Montgomerys hopefully go home. <laughs> now then, what are you going to build? And what are you going to give your life to? That is not just noble, but eternal. Let me end with this. We have buildings on this campus that are over 50 years old. This building's one of them. The library building's 40 years old. We have other buildings that are over 50 years old. I think the newest building on our campus is the dorm, and it's about 14 or 15 years old now. We're all sitting in places, serving in a place, working in a place, doing ministry in a place, that some of you built, but others certainly did. 40 and 50 years ago. We receive financial benefit because of the efforts of people a generation ago and two generations ago. You own eight and a half acres of property here. The Lord does. Okay, in the heart of Oakland. That's because men and women bought it and, 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 and utilized the resources. And guess what happens today? Do you know how much rent is today? Is it better to be a landlord or a renter in this environment? We're landlords for a lot of property that generates a lot of income. Aren't you glad someone had the vision to do that? So my question is, what are we going to pass on so that 50 years from now, should the Lord tarry, some other pastor is standing in, in, in the pulpit and hopefully not speaking to, to uh, just a... I don't, uh, this congregation, but hopefully filling this place eight times on a Sunday. And stands and says, I thank God for the faith of my fathers. I thank God for the foresight of those who stood before me. Because now we have a witness in the city of Oakland that transcends the moment. Most of the sermons I preach to you are vision-oriented and they're inspirationally desired. I'm trying to compel you to understand what the Spirit is saying in a moment. This is not as preachy, but it is the same thing. I'm trying to help you understand what the Spirit is calling us to in this moment. And commit ourselves to, for at least the next five years, putting the framework in place. And will I make mistakes? Yes. Will Gary make mistakes? Probably not, but I, I will. <laughs> Look at the record. <laughs> uh, candidly, your record's pretty good there, buddy. <laughs> will we make mistakes? Yeah. But will you join me in asking the Holy Spirit to help grant us the courage sufficient to the task that we will obey him?
that we will obey him.